So we've gotten to the point where we can take a beam of charged particles all moving at different speeds and select out particles that are going at a specific speed. Now what? What can we do with that? It's a good thing we went over the velocity selector in the previous video because that's going to be our starting point in this video. Now that we know how a velocity selector works, let's just treat it like a black box so we can send a beam of charged particles into the box and it spits out a beam with less particles but all moving at a specific speed that we selected out. That's all we need to know to make progress. The way a mass spectrometer works, or at least one kind of mass spectrometer works, is as soon as charges exit the velocity selector, we have a magnetic field that acts on the charged particles, but this time without the electric field. Remember, in our velocity selector, we had both an electric and a magnetic field, which created forces that perfectly balanced out for charges moving at just the right speed. But now we have only a magnetic field. It doesn't even have to be the same magnetic field as the one inside the velocity selector. So what happens now? Well, in the absence of the electric field, a magnetic field is going to cause the charged particles that exit the velocity selector to deflect. How are they going to deflect? Well, if the charged particles are positive, they're going to feel a magnetic force by the right hand rule. Pointing our right fingers in the direction of the velocity and curling them in the direction of the magnetic field, which is out of the screen here, has our thumb point downwards, which is the direction of the force. We also know that the region of uniform magnetic field is going to cause the charge to experience centripetal motion as the force keeps up with the changing velocity and stays perpendicular to it, again by the right hand rule. So if we ignore tiny gravity and any tiny amount of electric repulsion between the ions or electrons themselves, the only force acting on these charged particles is the magnetic force. In that case, since the magnetic force always stays constant in magnitude and perpendicular to the velocity, we can say the centripetal force acting on the particle is the magnetic force. They are one and the same, so their magnitudes are the same as well. The magnitude of the centripetal force is the mass times the centripetal acceleration and the magnitude of the magnetic force is QVB here, since the velocity and magnetic field vectors are always at right angles to each other. We know the centripetal acceleration is just V squared over R, so we have MV squared over R is equal to QVB. We can divide one of the Vs out and multiply by R on both sides, and we have MV is equal to QRB. Now, if we divide by Q and V on both sides, we're left with this expression. The ratio of mass to charge of each particle is given by the radius times the magnetic field strength divided by the velocity. We can't really go any further with this equation, so let's stop for a second and ask ourselves, what do we know here? Well, we know the B field strength, that might just be like a dial on a machine that we can tune. We also know the speed, V, that was specifically what we selected for out of the velocity selector. What about r, the radius of the circle of motion? Well, the way we design our mass spectrometer here is we have a detector array on the sides that can determine where a particle hits. It's like an experimental game of battleship. So if the array starts at, say, 0 meters out of the opening, it can digitally determine the distance from that opening to the place where a particle hits. And then that distance is just the diameter of the circle of motion. It's 2 times the radius. So that means R is experimentally determined for us as well. In that case, I've sneakily set up our equation here so that everything on the right hand side is known, which means we can completely determine the mass to charge ratio of whatever particle was fed in. Now, what's the point of all this? Well, let's use propane as an example, a substance with three red carbon atoms and eight light blue hydrogen atoms, all bonded through electrons. If you can take a neutral substance like this propane and bombard it with electrons, it's enough to pop electrons off the molecules of the substance and turn them into positive ions of that same substance. The electrons also have enough energy to break up the molecule itself, so you end up with ionized fragments of the original substance too. Then you can just shoot all those ions through a mass spectrometer, so first the velocity selector part, then the part with just the magnetic field. Of course, the fragments that aren't charged, colored white here, they don't get deflected by the magnetic field because they're not charged. As for the other fragments, they have different masses, so the small ones accelerate quickly and the large ones accelerate more slowly. That means different size fragments hit different spots on the detector array. 
And what you end up with is something like a fingerprint for this particular substance. In our case, we used propane, but it could have been any other substance. Seems pretty weird, but the data output from real life mass spectrometers do actually look something like this graph on the side here. The x-axis on each of these data outputs is just the m over q ratio, which we remember is determined directly from the trajectory radius, the magnetic field strength, and the speed of the ions. And the y-axis is just the relative frequency of occurrence of these m over q ratios. We see that each substance gives us its own unique mass spectrometry plot. So with such a tool, all we need are tiny amounts of a substance, and we're able to identify environmental pollutants, pesticide residues on food, and controlled substances. As an example, the graph you see on the screen here is the mass spectrometry output for the chemical compound cocaine. So we can even use mass spectrometers to figure out the composition of an unknown street drug. There are people who become experts at reading these types of mass spectrometry graphs, but that goes far beyond the scope of physics. That'd be more of a job for the chemistry nerds. Peep cam? Uh, no, I don't really feel like it.